we'll get ahead and start. Um, I'm the chair of this ethnographic working group, which is called Clean Parking as Fieldwork. Um, I'm Wynton Overby, and I guess I just wanted to describe the background of the three panelists and kind of the general aims of the working group before we started. Um, so I'm a PhD candidate at Cornell University's Department of Architecture, and I'm being trained as a historian of architecture and urbanism. Um, I've published on the multimedia character of a recent panoptic prison and the gal which I'll be presenting on today somewhat, and the egalitarian potential of the architectural diagram, but I'm writing a dissertation entitled The Seekers, which is a pro project that consists of five ethnographic case studies tracing iconic post-war American Christian popular cultural figures and their spatial placement. A lot of this project has taken me to literal theme parks. I spent over two months at Dolly Parton's theme park home pilgrimage site Dollywood, wandered through Disneyland half stone, chased off the property of the Holy Land experience, <laughs> gotten lost in the abandoned heritage USA, and rode the Coney Island cyclone in the snow. But as I will lay out in my paper, and I hope the other panelists will suggest, I believe that theme parks have become a verb, theme parking, and that this action is one to be undertaken by researchers seeking to understand contemporary global societies. So the panel is premised in the claim that not only architectures and urbanisms riffing on theme parks, but also embodied experiences and stories associated with theme parks have, over the course of the 20th and into the 21st century, expanded beyond the formal walls of the theme park. Um, so I guess that my, or the thrall of this project to me is the fact that I grew up in Northern Florida, so I spent a large part of my childhood going to and from Disney and SeaWorld and Universal, um, and my mother still sometimes makes me go to the Christmas parade at Walt Disney World. Um, so Scott Lucas, who's sitting right here, received his PhD in cultural anthropology from Rice University. He's written and edited six published volumes, most recently, the Immersive World Handbook, Designing Theme Parks and Consumer Spaces, which was published in 2012 by Focal Press, and over 40 articles and book chapters. He also curates several websites, including the Gender Ads Project, which is really interesting if uh, you wanted to check that out. He's the chair of the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at Lake Tahoe Community College, which he received the McGraw Hill American Anthropological Association Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching in 2005 for. Um, Larry Kasuf is a writer and creative consultant working in the areas of traditional, interactive, and themed entertainments. Since 1986, he has run his own design firm, Narrative Concepts, which develops thematic and narrative concepts, experiential design platform, and scripts for amusement attractions, museums, leisure destinations, cultural heritage sites, and other place-making ventures. He was the head writer and co-designer of Paramount Television Group's Story Drive Engine Project, and his other clients include Walt Disney Imagineering, AOL Time Warner, BRC Imagination Arts, the USC Institute for Creative Technologies, and the Pacific Park on Santa Monica Pier. He serves as a lecturer on UCLA's School of Theater, Film, and Television faculty, and his practice has not only led him to be one of Scott's ethnographic subjects, but also, more importantly, gives him deep, rich insight into the design and function of theme parks. So that's a brief overview. Um, I'll be reading my paper. I wish that I had prepared enough to actually like give it impromptu, but that isn't what happened. Um, so the topic is theming carceral ontologies, um, and I guess I'm going to try and relate it to my pedagogy and like how my students at the Cornell School of Architecture approach space and the sorts of spaces that they actually learn in. So I teach a freshman writing seminar to architecture students called Theme Parking at Cornell University. Theme parking could be reductively defined as the use of style and spatial configurations to elicit specific responses from consumer users, usually creating a sense of comfort in order to tap into their primal desires, to loosen their pockets and manipulate their sentiments. These styles are usually syncretically historical, whether alluding to 19th century American main streets, like at Walt Disney's theme parks, or 20th century modernisms, 
like Victor Gruen's mall. The theme parking phenomenon goes far back. We can see it in the 19th century panoramas that created 360 degree views of foreign cities and landscapes, transporting urbanites unable or unwilling to travel to Rome. And we can also see it in 15th and 16th century Italian Sacro Monte, or sacred mountains dotted with chapels in which frescoes and sculptures recreated the life of Christ. By ritualizing experiences and literal theme parks pushing bodies from imitative urban landscapes through lines into attractions and back into miniaturized cities, themed environments actualize our fantasies and nightmares at a cost that prevents many from enjoying them. Admission and inclusion differs between typology, but renders theme parking an act of community building where shared values foster belonging. The acknowledges of and produced by these communities are controlled to maintain the master narratives around which their communities cluster. We begin my class theme parking by reading four texts. An essay by anthropologist Kathleen Stewart on precarity, which defines places resulting from embodied scenes, embodied scenes of recognition. James Clifford's introduction to writing culture, whose frontispiece is pictured here, and stresses ethnog that ethnography doesn't begin with participant observation or interpreting others' texts, but rather with writing or with the making of texts. Third, an article by feminist film study scholar Marianne Duan on the close-up, which suggests that the scale and detail of that kind of shot renders the human body spatial. And fourth, Delirious New York by Rip Coolhouse, which proposes that Coney Island um, was kind of the template for the urban and architectural growth of 20th century Manhattan. Um, so this occurs in the first chapter of Delirious New York, which I signed, and um, basically it lays out that Coney Island is the progenitor of what he terms Manhattanism, or the city's fantastical 20th century boom of gridded horizontal and vertical built environments. So the Cool House quotes Frederick Thompson, who is the co-founder of Luna Park, one of the themed attractions or amusement parks at Coney Island which actually reopened recently after having been closed from the 1920s through uh, the early 2000s. Um, so he quoted him at length regarding the use of architectural styles. I've built Luna Car Park on a definite architectural plan. As it is a place of amusement, I have eliminated all classical and conventional forms from its structure and taken a sort of free renaissance and oriental type from my model in order to get the restive, joyous effect to be derived always from graceful lines. It is marvelous what you can do in the way of arousing human emotions by the use you make architecturally of simple lines. Luna Park is built on that theory. I begin my genealogy of theme parking with Cool House because his, he and his firm, the Office for Metropolitan Architecture, or OMA, are responsible for the new architecture building at Cornell. Milstein Hall, pictured here. The way that Rim and his firm think about lines and fantasies, as told through Frederick Thompson, is what they consider to be the clearest means of making programmatic interventions into space. And all of these linear programmatic interventions are derived from an early 20th century amusement park. More complexly, according to Cool House, Coney Island embodies the technology of the fantastic, or technology for the support and production of fantasy, as an instrument and extension of the human imagination. OMA's fantastical linear mode informs my daily life and the daily life of my students in direct ways. OMA, or perhaps Cornell, seeking to reify the building more an object than a functioning subject, dictated that the backs of every desk in the studios be kept at the same height as pictured here. The powers that be further insisted that many nooks and other spaces be left unused at the same time as the building's aesthetic rigor demands daydreaming about one's own potential. During Milstein's inaugural year, the architecture department would send out frequent emails about the improper uses of the space. Many times, students were scolded for taking naps or hanging hammocks between the triangular steel trusses adjacent to the building's windows, desirous to literally dream in the new technological object. The batch of students that received these emails was all but gone, and along with it the institutional memory, 
but the rules remain and the daydreaming not encouraged. Writing ethnographies of such spaces reopens these spaces of daydreaming. Through immersing oneself within environments commonly deconstructed from afar or removed from mediation, one can discover that the politics of a global community building phenomena like green parking. It would seem that, according to Cornell's administration, Milton Hall is intended to be seen from afar, not lived within at the same time as the Department of Architecture leverages it cynically as a kind of theme park because it sells architectural culture as an experiential commodity fantasy to young strivers seeking to kind of get architectural education in a building by the premier firm in the world. Ethnography offers users of buildings like Milstein the opportunity to reconstruct inconsequential sensations and emergent details that occur in these buildings in order to create a personal history theory that can illuminate the oblique fantasies drawing one continuously towards Coney Island or Milstein and to find belonging with others who harbor the same fantasy, such as becoming an architect or I guess going on a roller coaster. Sitting, reflecting upon, and writing about environment, like the anthropologist in the throes of field work on writing cultures cover, forces myself and my students to uncover technologies rather than to fuel fantasies, to blow up or zoom in on our present state of being rather than an idealized future outcome. Later in the term, in conjunction with studying historic prisons that have been rehabbed as malls and haunted houses, we read Olme's first manifesto, which was published in 1971, entitled Exodus, or the Voluntary Prisoners of Architecture. In this text, Ren Poolhouse and another of Olme's founding partners, Elia Zinglis, describe their primal architectural fantasy. Half of the city of London has been abandoned, and a wall has been erected around a rectangular strip of land that remains inhabitable. The population of London will, as the title suggests, voluntarily relocate behind this wall out of disgust with historic London, what they call a behavioral sink or cesspool. The project was actually based upon Ren Poolhouse's thesis at the Architectural Association in London, um, which he proposed to be on the Berlin Wall as a site of fantasy. So there's an idea that within the cinder of the city, there's a strip of land in which people can kind of create an idealized or utopic environment out of something that's traditionally deemed, I guess, derelict or bearing cultural trauma. So defensive walls serves as a prologue on OMA's 2014 Elements History Manifesto concerning walls. Poolhouse and his collaborators claim that all the shifting manifest out of all the shifting manifestations of the wall, the defensive wall best captures the element's primal political character as a way of a setting a limit between self and other. Defensive walls physically manifest national myth-making or even local myth-making, such as that constructed by Cornell University's Department of Architecture, as well as existential anxieties. Theme park spaces certainly have walls. Walt Disney World and skyscrapers are both given structure and divided from extra corporate spaces by walls from the outside world, places outside of the I guess environments that you pay or are being paid to be within, while prisons, offices, and houses further and intentionally subdivide interior spaces. In each of these cases, walls are erected for personal privacy or for social confinement. But in Exodus, the wall, a simple architectural line, liberates those it encloses, as well as the new city's architectural language. So to quote Exodus, the life inside produces a continuous state of ornamental frenzy and decorative delirium, an overdose of symbols. So kind of this deconstruction of historical forms that I guess Coolhouse was uh, referencing um, when he quoted one of Coney Island's founders. While the line itself is a strip that is like a runway, a landing strip for the new architecture of collective monuments. And this idea of the strip is kind of a themed notion that occurs within modernist architecture that Corbusier um, kind of fetishized the airline liner um, as well as the automobile and the notion of transit as an analogy to the modernist house. 
Um, so they're kind of riffing on this genealogy a little bit and theming their space to be in dialogue with this sort of canonic modernism at the same time as they're deviating from it with these sorts of like photo collages as pictured here that are highly irreverent and synthesize all these different cultural elements. <coughs> so Poolhouse and Zingalis execute an exodus with their wives who are both painters and illustrated the text for the men. And their foursome, following Poolhouse's suggestion, form the Dr. Caligari Cabinet for Metropolitan Architecture, combining the titles of the 1920s German films, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Fritz Lang's Metropol Metropolis, with that of a 1927 article called Large Town Architecture by German modernist architect Ludwig Hilfersheimer. So this sort of multimedia synthesis between film and text is key to OMA's recuperation of space from imprisonment <coughs> to become a technology of fantasy because modern medias furnish the precarious with to nourish starved souls within modern society. Themed spaces like Exodus hinge upon an economy that produces built environments and circulates themed products that reinforce the space's structural and ideological forms. The majority of Exodus reads like a filmic ethnography, drawing readers through each of eight successive spaces contained with the new London walls, as if along a strip of film, providing detailed descriptions of each. The journey begins, as with any themed space, by disciplining prisoners into narrative, conceptual, and legal submission. Yet this process is hedonistic and is executed by providing leisure and luxury and well-being. The collage painting picture here is for the reception area in which prisoners are received. This process presents Vietnamese guerrilla warriors ushering new prisoners in and Texas Rangers observing them nude, passing into the walled structure. And layered in several different media with literally stripped bodies, Exodus is reception area suggests that one must strip down both media and persons to their bare individual elements, the state of deconstructing oneself to the state of precarity and imprisonment in order to bring them as close as possible to their fantasies and to articulating their experiences of the built environment. So Poolhouse and Zinglis give their readers the vocabulary to unshackle themselves from their everyday prisons and to enter their text which functions, just like the baths described in the text and pictured here, as a social condenser, bringing hidden motivations, desires, and impulses to surface to be refined for recognition, provocation, and development. Social condensation, which I encourage my students to enact in their papers describing their design processes in Milstein Hall, implies, just like Exodus's illustrations, the overlaying and intercutting of spatial programs or functions through circulation. By texturally and visually walking us through successive programs, Poolhouse and Zingley suggest that one may maximize the space potentials by experientially recollecting and projecting its potentials textually. Of their 379 projects, Ome has only designed one formal prison, and these designs were not executed. Prison is pictured here, um, and it's a panoptic prison. In 1979, the Dutch government commissioned OMA to renovate an 1886 domed pan panoptic prison in Arnhem, the Netherlands. OMA proposed cutting two corridors, pictured here, which he terms archaeological circles that reveal the historical layers of the building below the guard post in the center of the prison. These circles would more easily allow prisoners to float freely throughout the prison. Johan Metzler, an architect engineer who served as the Dutch engineer of prisons and consulates and designed the original prison, intentionally invoked 18th century English moral reformer Jeremy Bentham's type, panoptic typological scheme, as later appropriated by 20th century historian philosopher Michel Foucault the Panopticon is a centralized dome structure with a raised guard post at center. 
From there, the guards may, unbeknownst to prisoners, surveil every inmate within their isolated cell. The panoptic guard tower was intended to symbolically and literally induce a new moral self-governance in prisoners, insisting within them, insisting upon and instilling within them order and social welfare. In revision, the design statement that Coolhouse wrote to accompany his firm's renovation proposal, he inverts the canoptic visual scheme. He claims that the prisoners now look in on the guards idly sipping coffee and circulate through the prison as if in Milan's Galleria Vittorio Emmanuel II, one of the world's first shopping malls dedicated to the first king of Italy. Like Bentham's Panopticon, the Galleria is four stories and centered around a dome, but unlike Bentham, the Galleria offered up a variety of stores or themed environments rather than a singular environment for users to choose between. In addition to adding two streets in the floor beneath the Panopticon, effectively rendering the former guard tower a monument that symbolized its past function without enacting it, only proposed opening up the entire facility to various programmatic potentials for prisoners, adding a library, barbershop, multiple shops, a kitchen, a patio, a judo room, a gym, artist studios, a pool, a track, and a sports field to the complex. Revision, like Exodus before, rereached the prison as a space of hope, ironically invoking and eschewing Bentham. Each of OMA's projects succeeding Exodus, as well as its early panoptic prison, used the same formal elements as these two projects, a strip in line and linearity to evoke the notion of prison. This essay, Revision, is another fantastical ethnography, like all of OMA's design proposals that accompany their projects, as well as the one for a Milstein Hall. Revision details how an individual would essentially engage the space as if it was realized. Moreover, the essay is included within OMA's 1995 book, SMXL, prefaced by a screen capture from Salvador Dali and Louis Bonnell's Un Chien the still image is of an eye being cut open by a knife. All May's vision for prison lays bare an ethnographic method imagined to be underneath the skin of its architecture's users, or readers, one that reveals the fantastic potential of themed spaces to transform lives. That is the conclusion of